This is painting number 66, and it's my second one that I did of the Second Avenue Deli. When there was an exhibit of Francis Tavern Museum, and one of the paintings in there was the Second Avenue Deli. And Abe came to look at it. And he stood there, and I think he had tears in his eyes because he said this. He said, you know, of all the things which I have in my life, my family is the most important to me. It would mean so much to me to have you do a painting of them. And what a joy it was to do this work. Many years later, I asked Amy's brother, Jack, what was the secret of family carried that made them so different from the rest of the restaurants of the Lower East Side? He said that it began with his parents, who handed out kindness, not only food. A quote from a newspaper explains it in another way. Perhaps these customers are pilgrims in search of soul food for the soul. And as Abe Leverhold's menu proclaims, we deliver. Okay, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Abe's family, because there's a reason. Sure. Why the immigrants who come to America created America, no matter where they came from. The labor, the labor wall family lived in Lvov, Poland, and their comfortable middle class family life was shattered in 1939 when Stalin and Hitler joined forces. Poland was divided and Lvov became part of the Soviet Union. You'll be reading a lot about it lately in the war notes because that I keep seeing that name, Lvov, which is now the Ukraine. A year later, the father, Ephraim Leverwolf, who owned a small lumber mill, was condemned as a capitalist, arrested and sentenced without trial to 10 years of hard labor in Siberia, and the business was confiscated. His wife, Ethel, and young son, Abe, that's our Abe, were forced to leave all possessions behind and were herded into cattle cars and deported to Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan, if I'm Can, not exactly. saying it wrong. Yes. Kazakhstan, thank you. Say it again. Kazakhstan, I think. I think so. That's Greg, who does it better than I did. In Central Kazakhstan. Asia. In 1941, the Russians granted amnesty to all Polish political prisoners, and Ephraim was released from the labor camp. But they had to remain in, Greg, you say the word. Kazakhstan. Right. Through the rema remainder of the war, scrounging at odd jobs to keep food on the table. After the war, they fled back alone to see if they could find any relatives alive. Everyone had been killed by the Nazis. Ironically, Ephraim's arrest and the family, the forced deportation, had saved their lives. And as you see the word, word knows, I'm going to be doing something. I'm going to mention in all my programs from now on, whenever I can, a story of immigrants, because we're back again in that world. And as they come here, remember A.B. and me, because I was a refugee from Hitler, and realize people didn't come to America for the riches. Now they might. But the settlers at the beginning fled. They fled from Ireland where there was a potato famine. And they had the greatness of this country. Which brings me to another immigration. Right now, and I'll bring that in because from now on, I'm going
going to make it my business to make us realize that who comes now is part of who our families were. Okay, now through Facebook, I found a relative from Panama and we became very good friends. He's the one who introduced me to Tyson in the writing that he did. But listen to this. Good morning, Tia Hetty. Tia means aunt. After my recent trip to Darien, near the border with Colombia, the panorama has changed drastically. For some months, the Haitians have not been the main group crossing the jungle. Their place has been taken by the Venezuelans. Dozens of Venezuelan families cross the jungle every day in hopes of escaping poverty and reaching the United States. Many are traveling to reunite with friends and loved ones who traveled here long ago. Here is a great story written by a colleague who is now is traveling to our offices in the Ukraine to help people over there. And that po they sent me the photographs and you see people, young people, old people crossing over hills and mountains and, and danger. Okay. Let's go back to the Second Avenue Delhi. Should I show the picture? Yes, would you show it? Thank you. This time I've organized. I have everything lined up for Greg to take. To tell you about the deli, when he was 23 years old, the place was closed, a closed luncheonette. He took it over with a partner and the first six years were rough. The area was in transition from 1954 to 1960. It was dead until Off-Broadway Theater began and the area came back to life. His partner was Izzy Lekowitz, okay? And I just want to show you how the prejudice existed against them. The German Jewish neighborhood in that area, the Lower East Side, was very angry when the foreigners came. And the one I saw an article at the Educational Alliance written in January 1895, because I'm trying to give you the history of us. It said, let me assure you, unless something is done to counteract the natural tendencies of these people, they, by reason of their numbers, will become a menace to our children to an extent that is to me appalling to contemplate. <laughs> so it wasn't only America that gave them a hard time. It was the ones who came before. I'm going to give you this to show to, for Greg to show you because this is when I when I was painting the deli, I did a drawing of what was on the floor. That's when the area became popular because the, the Broadway opened up. And this has to do with Broadway, to see the stars. This might be clearer to see. It's the original. You're seeing a copy. <laughs> and the children, David, David, um, no. This is the baby. In the picture of the family, there was a baby in the carriage. Here is my drawing of the baby. There were twins. Should we point them out in the picture? Yes. Okay. 
um, in the photograph here. See the baby in the carriage? That's the baby. The baby is called um, E-L-I. And the twins are called Svi and Ayala. And the last name of the children is Barrax. See, I wrote the notes years ago when I did the painting, and I'm remembering now. Now let me show you what I think is a treasure. And this is the original menu. And I'll open it, just read a few of the things of the prices, and you will know how things have changed. Do you want to read some of them, Kurt? Mm -hmm. The regular ones, the ones that people now can figure out. You know. <coughs> because prices are no longer what they were. Hungarian beef goulash, eleven forty-five. <laughs> Roast beef, twelve forty-five. When is this from? I open sandwiches. Roast turkey, nine seventy-five. <laughs> Where's your wines? Do you even have wine? Can all of you hear him well? Because I can hear him perfectly. Okay. So much happened lately that I am not able to do everything the way I wanted to. Because so much happened to me in the last few days. And I wanted to put everything in. And I can. So I'll mention some of the things. Should, 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 I, should I read some comments? Should I read some comments? Yes, I'd love it. Okay, let me... Um, okay. There's a few things about the sound. <laughs> sound was good. Sound was cutting out. Sorry. We, we Some people have to... I think some people said refresh your screen if the sound cuts out. I noticed a few people had that problem. Um, okay. Except it's going through the phone, not the mic. But we'll fix that uh, for next time. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Tammy Smith, hello, Hetty. Good to see you back. Wonderful. Sorry, to yes. around. Sorry we were out last week. So, Hetty, we couldn't do it for Hetty. Um, Julie Williams, good evening, my dears. Carol Hotkin, hi, everybody. Joe got his sound back. <laughs> uh, pa Paula Lakshan, love you guys. Tammy Smith lost the sound. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Ken Page, this is amazing. <laughs> um, Julie Williams, we stop into the new location of the Second Avenue Deli on the Upper East Side every so often, just so we can see Hedy's painting on the placemats, and as a mural on the back wall of the restaurant. But I believe that the one is a laser printing of the deli. Oh, sorry, a later printing, <laughs> later painting of the deli. Is that true? She wants to know if that's true. No, it's the same one, but it's done differently. Okay, same one done differently. Okay. Right. Um, John Terracuso, hugs from California. And Marsha Bard uh, Isman, hi, Hetty. Hi. And from Marsha, we love you. <laughs> hi, all of you. I love you so. Okay, now, here's what we're going to do, because there are so many things that happened to me during the last two weeks because I wasn't here this week, last week. And I have to tell you about every one of them. So I'll tell you a little bit for the next few weeks. Okay. 
let me begin first of all that I'm going to become a different person because I realized my world has become so huge because I once sat on a street corner and began to paint and it was very difficult because women did not sit on street corners in order to paint <laughs> for other reasons, yes. <laughs> and because the paintings look so frighteningly ugly when I begin. But I didn't, I remained very ladylike <laughs> and, and was very polite. And through strange coincidences, my son, Ken, went to New Paltz for college and about 10,000 people, including Mylene, who's watching today, started, started my life with a network of people who know me because Kenny went to New Paltz and met Eileen and Paula and that world. And one of them is Ed. And Ed loves his camera the way I love my pencil. And he treats the camera the way I treat my pencil, not paint. Paint is difficult because what you put down is not what appears until you layer it and layer it and layer it. But he started taking photographs of me. And we're trading off because I'm drawing him and he's able to photograph me. And I won't show you the photographs now because there are too many other things, but I promise that I will. And he said to me, smile. So I gave a dignified smile. And he said, no, laugh. And I have never laughed into a camera. Because I lose my eyes when I laugh. They get very small. <laughs> he said, laugh. So I laughed. And so the photographs, when you see them, taught me how to it's okay to laugh. And my friend Fran came this week and we went out for pizza. And we sat in the one place that had sunlight. And Fran said, you know, I've decided I need to laugh. We don't laugh anymore. So let's laugh. And we laughed. And when I got home, I thought, what have I missed in my life to be who I am? Who am I? I've been trained so correctly how to behave, which means you don't laugh wildly. I'm going to, okay? And I'd like all of you to start thinking of what did you learn in your growing up years? Because during the 60s, a new group of Americans arose who burnt their bras, who, who wore dungarees which were ripped. In my painting, which you're going to be seeing, is there a way? No, I'll show you next week. But the manager of my city of New York, of Long Beach, is wearing, she sent me a photograph where she has, where, where she's wearing jeans with holes in them, just like everybody wears now. And I thought, there are people coming out of the closets. The only thing I'm going to miss in this new generation coming up, they don't write anymore. They do the letter U instead of Y-O-U. I can deal with that. But they text, and texts are so boring. 
because you don't see the face. So I'll miss that as I enter into the next century. Okay? So I decided my paints were so old because I haven't been painting lately. I've been working with pencils. And I decided no. You see, when you take a pencil and paper, you begin immediately. There's no work. But my paint box had become encrusted. And I decided no. I can't afford this. I'm going to be the new 21st, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25th. I don't know how long we're going to live. If we keep on with the wars and the killings, it might be the last century that exists. And maybe only a part of it. So I began my work at the beginning because I wanted to change the world. And I knew that I could change it if everybody began to know everybody. Then how could they hate them? Well, as you can see from the war right now, they're still able to hate. But I'm not going to stop. Hmm. So I began to paint. And I didn't do the painting yet. That begins tomorrow morning, this painting. But here is what it's going to look like. Oops. See, everything is stuck. Yep. But I have Greg here, so if it's very stuck. Okay. He's stronger than I am. No idea. Let me tell you about this, okay? Can you show yep. this? The, 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 the side is clean. Okay. Everything is clean except the inside. Could oh. you show it to the picture? You mean the inside or? The inside. Okay. Because I'm going to tell them as I work. Oh, I see. Oh, then we can flatten it. Yes. I didn't put the blue yet because <laughs> I'm so tired. <laughs> you know, I have to open everything with a nutcracker because... But next week, I'll be painting during the class, during the lecture. Not much. But what I found out was that it's the most beautiful black in the world that you can get if you take a red color called alizarin crimson and a green, a green which is very, very dark, and you mix them together, little bits, and it is the most glorious black in the world. Mm. Because black is boring. White is boring. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Because there is no black in nature. There is no white in nature. It's something to remember also when you deal with prejudice. When I paint a portrait, I figure out which grounds to put on the base of the face. Because None of us are pink and none of us are black. True. Right? So you watch that when I work. And how much time do I have? I'm rich. You have six minutes. I've got six minutes. Okay. My alizarin crimson died. In the, in the time in between it exploded or something. Oh. This is the old palette. I had to throw all of it away. It's dry. Mm -hmm. But the alizarin crimson, it exploded. It went all over my hands. Oh. Pencils don't do that to you. <laughs> we'll get you more. <laughs> so I'm warning you about that. <laughs> okay. I met people. Oh, the last thing that I must talk about is, and I'll embellish it next week. I went to a wonderful lecture of Michael Albert. What he does, and I knew his mother, 
and she used to give me the boxes from Reynolds Wrap because I could put my brushes in them. Mm. And she gave him boxes and things. And what he did, he cut things out of it. And he made these wonderful, wonderful compositions, completely abstract, or wrote letters. And next week I'll be able to show you the book that he did. I had, I put it here, but now I realized I don't know it would be underneath, underneath my cell phone. But I'm going to, I'm going to spend a lot of time on his book. No, it's not there. Not there? I put it away, away. Okay. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. Next week we're going to get him in detail. But I met his wife, and I found out if you see a wonderful husband, it's because his wife is wonderful. <laughs> and so is his daughter, and his daughter's boyfriend. And I'll talk about them next week. When Greg doesn't say there's only a minute left. You have four minutes. I have four minutes left. But during this lecture period, spoke with such warmth and friendliness that everybody began to work immediately. And they all did artwork. And so next week I'm going to speak of him and the people and the painting because early tomorrow morning I'm going to start painting. Okay. And the only bad thing is the paint smell. This does not smell. And I always blamed the turpentine. I was wrong. <laughs> it's the paints that smell. <laughs> but it's worth it because I can open windows now. It's yes. not winter anymore. Turpentine's bad though. Yes. Mm -hmm. Are there any people I should speak to? Yes, I'll read some more comments. Um, <clears throat> Ken, love what you said, how your world became a, so big because of that decision. When you were on the street, remember sitting on the street made your world big. Yes. So, um, Eileen Cutler, I love imagining Hetty and Eddie and their photo sessions. The portraits are gorgeous. What a team, bringing out the best in each other. And Joe Tripp gave hearts. That's it so far. You have two minutes left. Okay. Then I want to tell you what it's like to be photographed. He allows me to, first of all, he brought a ton of hats. Yes. <laughs> One of them was a beret. Yes. A red beret. And I looked wonderful in it. You couldn't yes. see that I have so little hair. So you'll see that next week. And, and I never knew that a camera could be a friend. To me, a camera is stand still and smile. <laughs> but he gave me a Muslim hat. He gave me a hippie hat. Yes. And you'll see next week, okay? And I learned that a machine if in the correct hands, becomes as wonderful as a pencil. Mm -hmm. And Greg, who is doing this today, Greg is a computer genius. And how often has he come into the room? And I said, Greg, I don't know, it's not working. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, and he goes boom, 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 and it works. And I, at 92 and a half, I'm not going to try a new world. But I wish I could begin at the beginning and feel at home with a machine. You can. <laughs> so um, I love all of you. It, it is seven thirty. One last comment from Tammy Smith. I want to find uh, one of those placemats at the deli. Oh, 
tell them that you were a close friend of the uh, of the artist, okay? And they'll give it to you. And Julie, thanks as always for this time together. Love you guys. Hugs and kisses. Thank you. Okay. Thank you all. And thank you, Greg. You're welcome. <laughs> I love you all. And tomorrow morning, I'm going to paint. Yay.